So with, with all of that said, I, I'll start with uh, my presentation, but I would like to give you permission to, um, to ask questions and, and stop me along the way if, if you would like to do that. Um, and if you have specific questions, um, either, you know, uh, uh, something that you're going to be involved in. I was trying to read through some of the, the comments and I, I saw that um, someone said that they're planning on offering an online course in the, in the near future. So if you have specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer those as well. So we'll just sort of get started. And as I mentioned to Liz, I can be really flexible. Um, so I, I want to share with you the professional development model that um, I designed for New Albany Plain Local Schools. Um, we, um, it, and, and, and say to you that this is just one high school's experience with implementing um, a blended learning initiative. Um, and I, I guess I shared a little bit of my bias um, already by saying that I believe professional development is important to implementing and sustaining any educational initiative. Um, in my experience, it, it seems that all too often we're asked to do something such as increase student achievement or implement the common core or differentiate instruction. Those are just a few that I've heard lately. Um, and in, in many cases, those requests are often not accompanied by the necessary professional development. So with that said, I focused uh, our initiative at our high school on, on faculty professional development. I just felt strongly about that. So um, let's see. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Sorry about that. Um, I used too many different different products here, so I had to find the arrow. Apologies there. So um, what is Project RISE? Well. Um, our high school received a $130,000 blended learning development grant to do just that, develop a blended learning program for our high school, and to be part of a blended learning longitudinal study for the state of Ohio. Um, and so the grant, which we received through, um, Liz will remember this, it used to be called SchoolNet, it's now eTech Ohio, it's a state agency. Um, the grant gave us the, the money and, I guess, the momentum to move forward with our high school innovation project. And we wanted something um, that could be replicable, that it was relatively innovative, and also a model that would be sustainable, um, as well as extending learning opportunities for our students, hence the acronym RISE, Replicable, Innovative, Sustainable, and Extends. Not, it doesn't, it's not really parallel there, but oh well. So um, anyway, um, we started, our faculty uh, started with an already developed mature face-to-face -face course that they transitioned to a blended model. Um, and that just means in, students learn in part um, online and also at a traditional face-to-face -face, um, school or a traditional brick-and-mortar school. So with the next few slides, I give you the big picture, sort of a timeline from where we started to where we are today, as well as our plans for 2013-2014 um, uh, school year. As I mentioned, we received a grant. We submitted our proposal in April of, of 2012, so a little over a year ago. And a month later, we were um, notified that we were one of seven districts in the state to receive this grant. And um, I was optimistic that, that we had a good chance at getting this grant, so I began working on a faculty development course and um, found myself working on that course well into the summer of, of 2012. Um, as I mentioned in May, we did receive notification from the state that we, that we got the grant, and we were pretty excited. And we held our first faculty informational meeting, um, I think it was June 7th. In any event, it was the last day of school, and it was at the end of the day on the last day of school. But surprisingly, we had over a third of the high school faculty um, attend that, um, that informational meeting. Um, 
After which, I sent a couple of email communications to the interested faculty regarding the grant requirements and expectations and as well as you know the roles and responsibilities because there, there were certain criteria that we absolutely positively had to commit to through 2017 because we were part of that longitudinal study. Um, in those uh, emails during the month of June, um, I was very transparent with faculty. Um, they, I wanted them to know that, that this was going to be um, a somewhat messy process because the state hadn't figured out um, what, what they really wanted in terms of, um, you know, blended learning programs. So we didn't really have any, any recipes, so to speak. Um, and this, this was intentional on, on our part, on my part. You know, I wanted faculty who were willing to commit the time, the energy, um, you know, to this, to this project. And they were not getting release time from their, you know, from an already busy and full teaching schedule. So that takes us into July, and the state required um, that we send at least two teachers and two administrators, a building and a district level administrator, to a two-day uh, summer PD in the middle of July. Um, and believe it or not, we ended up with three teachers who were uh, willing to, to attend the professional development as well as the, the administrators. And even after the, those two days, which were pretty grueling um, uh, days, uh, they were still interested in participating, you know, in this, in this project. Um, so I continued to communicate with um, faculty during the month of July, during which I um, shared with them an application to participate. And we're a Google Docs district or a Google Apps district. And so this was um, a, a Google form. And basically, we asked them to identify the course that they wanted to transition to a blended model. And just to briefly explain why they thought you know, they wanted to blend this course. And then just some other basic information like um, whether it was a required course or um, an elective, a semester course, or you know, a year-long course. Um, so in in August, um, I'm trying to think when we started our school year. I think last year we started August 15th. So by August, I had um, I had received all of the applications to participate. In fact, I had those. I think they were due on July 3rd, and we had about 14 or 15 teachers who um, submitted the application. So when we started on August 15th, um, again, the first day back from summer break and after school, I held um, an, a, a mandatory meeting for those faculty who had applied to participate, giving them, you know, an opportunity to withdraw. And all throughout my communication in the summer, they had an opportunity to reconsider. Um, because some of them didn't know what their teaching schedules were going to be when they left in June. And um, by August, they certainly knew what their teaching schedules were going to look like. So we did have, um, I believe four faculty withdraw because of their teaching schedules, and um, I think one just uncertain uh, if she wanted to continue. So we ended up with 10 faculty, and I am so excited to say that those 10 faculty are still uh, with us today. Um, so it, you know, it wasn't it wasn't all that horrible. Um, and then we um, we started our um, we we announced the final ten and then um, started our first graduate class, which was Introduction to Designing Online Courses, and that began officially on September fifth. So that's the professional development that I'm talking about. You know, once faculty were committed to this journey, we call it our blended learning journey, I was committed to providing them with the professional development, the support, the resources, you know, um, to, um, to prepare them for this, this journey. So the introduction to designing online courses, which I'll, I'll talk about the topics in a little bit, um, really focused on pedagogy and practice. 
it was an opportunity to build their background knowledge while at the same time to transition their face-to-face -face course to a blended model. Uh, to continue on with the timeline then, um, as I said, we started our course in, in um, September. It was a 15-week graduate course, and that ended in December with lots of celebrations and um, right before uh, winter break. And then and when faculty returned, faculty and students returned in January from winter break, that is when they implemented their, um, their new blended course. So for both faculty and students, the start of the second semester was also the start of their blended course. And then um, we started a second graduate course, which was called a supervised practicum. And I, I based that primarily on, um, I used a lot of reflection strategies. Again, it was an opportunity to provide uh, faculty with support while they were implementing their courses and um, they maintained um, a, a, a journal, a reflection journal throughout. Um, and I also provided them with, with some readings that primarily had to do with um, you know, facilitating online courses and some of the challenges of like, um, you know, designing intentional um, interactions, like discussions is, is certainly one way and, you know, they struggled with, you know, some of that. Um, and then, um, so our first face-to-face -face course was in February uh, and, and by the way, our our two graduate courses were blended, so I, I wanted it to be um, a model for their course as well. So we didn't always meet face to face. And then last Friday, we had our we held our final face to face class and celebrated our, our success. So what I would like to do at this point is just ask a couple of questions, um, and we can use the um, the check mark for yes and the X for no. So for those of you who are joining me today, I would be interested in knowing if you've ever taught an online or blended course. And if you have, you can use the check mark. If you haven't, you can use the X. Okay, so it looks like we have a almost 50-50. Um, and then, um, yep, thank you, Liz, for putting that the poll result, the results up there and clearing the board. So now, if you responded yes, did you participate in any formal training or preparation to teach online or blended blended course? Great. Well, that's somewhat encouraging to know that some of you did receive some, some formal preparation um, to teach online. Um, I shared with Liz that um, my doctoral work is also in faculty uh, preparation uh, for teaching online and um, much of the, the research suggests that many faculty report um, having little, if any, training to prepare them to teach online. Um, and this is in higher ed. Um, and I can only speak uh, to my experience in K-12, the, the folks that I've worked with around the state of Ohio, um, most of them have said that they had no formal training, that the type of training that they received had to do with the technology component, like how to use the learning management system or um, how to create uh, a Google form. So it was very, um, very much how to use the technology as opposed to the uh, to the pedagogy. So thank you for uh, indulging me there. Um, as I said, the um, the course was designed to include both pedagogy and practice. So um, I wanted to help the the, um, the faculty build their their background knowledge um, about online teaching and learning, and much of what we know in K-12 uh, is, is based on either what's come out of higher ed or some of the virtual um, uh, charter schools around the country. Um, 
And then in terms of designing online courses, I wanted to I wanted to use tools. So I was familiar with and am a, a Quality Matters uh, certified trainer. So I wanted to use the Quality Matters rubric. And there is a Quality Matters rubric for higher ed, and there's a Quality Matters rubric for 612. So I designed our graduate course using the Quality Matters um, rubric as a framework for my design um, and, and making sure that I you know, was including the, um, the Quality Matters uh, general standards. So you see there um, a, little, a little bit of background on introduction to online teaching and learning. So that, um, that has, has to do with, um, you know, what's, what's going on in the field. And then designing online courses, an introduction to design elements, including uh, Quality Matters. Um, but also um, designing a curriculum. So we, we use a sort of backwards design approach. Some of you are probably familiar with understanding by design, that framework. And then um, really taking a look at their current course. So the, the next um, two items you see there, organizing course content, aligning goals, objectives, assessments, and activities really looking at their existing face-to-face -face course and, and making sure that those things align. And then um, beginning the design work, looking at your assessments and looking at your activities and perhaps redesigning those for the online environment or in some cases creating new ones. Um, and then the other um, item, setting up the course in the learning management system and we use Schoology. Um, prior to last year, we were a Moodle school and we transitioned to Schoology. Um, someone mentioned Edmodo in, in the chat. Schoology is similar to Edmodo in that it's a, what I call a, a social uh, design, a learning management system that, um, you know, is, is more like a social network interface. Um, and then, actually populating the course in the learning management system, you know, building it. And then um, they went through a, a peer review and we used a modified or informal Quality Matters uh, checklist uh, to conduct peer reviews. And then they had an opportunity to, um, you know, revise uh, their course and then they presented their implementation plans. In other words, what they plan to do when they came back in January. And then each faculty member presented um, at our, you know, on our celebration day, uh, his or her uh, final presentation. So I see that there are some questions in, in the chat. And um, if you would just like with um, any of those, I guess, emoticons, either the smiley face or the check. If you want me to stop here and answer some of those questions, would you just indicate with a check or a smiley face? Okay, great. Thanks. Um, all right, so I don't know how far back I'm, I, I'll go. Let's see. Um, what type of support was provided to faculty during the transition process? Okay, I use that, that term pretty broadly. Um, I was their primary support, um, so sometimes it, it felt a little bit like therapy um, it, because this is a messy process and it's very, uh, very time consuming. But I also provided um, technical support. So let's say they were, um, they were struggling with, with something, something wasn't working, um, then I, you know, I, I was there. Um, in some cases, I um, scheduled a time with faculty, say for example, um, they wanted me to come to their classroom and just give their students an overview of Schoology, you know, and their course. So I did support um, that, that looked sort of like that. Um, trying to think of some, some other things that, uh, that might have happened. 
that's that's what comes to mind right now. Um, so yeah, and somebody put in uh, the Quality Matters link. You can also go to um, I think it's qmprogram.org. They recently changed or gave their web page a facelift, um, so it looks a little different than it than it did um, a few weeks ago. Um, but I think it's just qmprograms.org. Um, if somebody, I don't know, Liz, if you have an opportunity to check that. Um, and, and, they'll, and they'll have a drop down for the K-12 uh, program. And then um, Karen asked, how did you find Schoology versus Moodle? Um, Karen, it's, to me, it's like apples to oranges. Um, I might say Moodle to Blackboard or to Angel or Desire to Learn is more apples to apples. Um, but Schoology to Moodle is more like apples to oranges. Um, I, I consider uh, LMSs or learning management systems such as Moodle, Blackboard, Desire to Learn, Angel, I call them my traditional learning management systems. They are the ones that I used when I um, was designing courses. And Schoology and Edmodo are sort of like working in Facebook <laughs> in a way. So um, some of our faculty, struggled a little bit with um, the migration from Moodle to Schoology. Um, Moodle, I think, has more flexibility. It, it is open source. It's designed to be flexible. Um, Schoology continues to add new features because it's still a, a relatively new, new company. And um, so for teachers who were not heavily invested in Moodle, the transition to Schoology was easier. Um, I don't know if, if there's anything specific about Moodle or Schoology and you want to ask that, I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer. Uh, the primary challenge was in the area of, of designing assessments for some of our you know, high-end Moodle users. And then why did you switch to Schoology? That's a great question, uh, Karima. Um, there, uh, there was some thought that um, Moodle was costing us um, money to uh, to manage, and there yes, there is a cost to Schoology as well. But um, we didn't have a lot of people who adopted Moodle, and there there was more of an emphasis from our central office to start using more digital resources and to um, you know use some some type of learning management system. So our tech department did some um, comparisons and looked at Schoology as well as a couple of other um, learning management systems and decided to go with Schoology. Um, so we, we do have a five-year contract with Schoology. So it'll be interesting to see um, you know, what happens in five years. And I hope that we'll collect some data to get that feedback from um, from faculty. And um, in terms of recommending Schoology, I, one of the things that, that I say to people when they ask me for recommendations, you know, what kind of computer should I buy or what kind of phone should I get or um, what do you think about this program, I usually um, answer with a question and that is what, what do you want to be able to do? And I am also a big one to comparison shop for lack of a better word. So you can probably find online charts that compare all of these learning management systems and I would say that many of them uh, will also give you um, a, a demo. Some of them will do a webinar and kind of walk through some things. So I would say shop before you know you buy and see what makes the most sense for your district or your organization. Um, I would also, I feel strongly about getting faculty involved, you know, because they're the ones that will be working with it. So maybe if you can have like a team that would be interested in, you know, working, working through um, some of the ones that you're considering. Um, let's see. So I've seen, I'm looking at Karen's, I've seen challenges when states have switched from a free LMS to a fee-based one and then Later, funding ran out. Uh, yes, 
that's always the case, isn't it? I was just having a conversation about that today. I mean, budgets are, it, it seems as though all money these days can be described as soft money. Um, they, um, I think they meaning central office uh, superintendents, it's tough. It's, it's always about um, doing more with less, even, even if you are in a district that's fortunate to pass levies. Um, I know that our district is, is considered a, um, a fairly wealthy district, but we are always doing more with less, and um, it's tough. Yeah, so you make a very good point. And, and Liz said, I love school G, although I wish they had badges. Yes, I'm sure that's, that's coming, right? Um, let's see. And then instructors, right, don't want to do online care. And I think that what you're saying there is they, they um, don't like it when you have to make a switch, right, to a new learning management system. Just when I've learned one, yes. Now you're going to uh, switch to another. I was meeting with a high school faculty member today who is actually not part of our blended learning um, cohort, but um, is pretty invested in Moodle, and, and our faculty will have Moodle for one more year. Um, so we've kind of uh, kept it, um, you know, for a while to ease the, the pain of the transition, but he said to me um, something to the effect, and then, and then what happens at the end of our five-year contract with Schoology? But, you know, it seems to me that since Web 2.0, since 2000, 2001, it's the nature of, of technology. Um, it, it, the only constant is change. Um, and I know that's not an answer that, you know, that, that people want, but it just is, it seems to be the nature of the beast. Um, it's a bit daunting because no one can keep up with it, you know. But, um, yeah, for now we have Schoology. We have it for four more years because we just finished our, our first year and hopefully, you know, we'll have it as long as it meets our needs and, and we can afford it because there is a there is a price associated with it. And there's a price associated with any anything that's quote unquote free. You know, you still have to have a server and you still have to have somebody manage it and, you know. So the nice thing about Schoology is that it's, you know, it's not a box. It's not a server that we have to manage. So that's true. Okay. Yes, total cost of ownership, that's for sure. Um, Yes, um, some learning management systems, it, it's easy to, you know, say bring your course from Moodle into Blackboard or Blackboard into Moodle, yeah. Um, and I think Schoology is getting much better at, uh, with that. Uh, at the first, uh, last summer when I worked with some faculty, and transitioning their courses, it was not pretty. It, it just looked like a um, a dump of stuff, and then we had to kind of go through and find things. And but it's getting it's getting better. So, all right, shall we go on? So now, just another quick question. Um, I am curious to know um, if any of you are familiar with Quality Matters. Okay, so I'm not sure. Um, Karen and Karima and Oranok, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, are you familiar with the higher ed uh, QM rubric or the, the um, 612? Okay, great. So one higher ed and one, one 612. Yeah, the 612, I, I was just curious. Um, uh, I'm actually working on some revisions for the 612 rubric, and it's, it's newer than, than the higher ed rubric. My familiarity, um, or no, is with the higher ed first, um, and then I, I became, um, you know, acquainted with the six, 
612 um, rubric. So um, thanks for, for indulging me there. Um, so as I said, um, we, I wanted to use a, a framework. I wanted something um, that, that people could sort of um, touch, if you will, you know, something tangible that, that, that they weren't just sort of designing um, or more, more than likely using the LMS as a repository. That rather there was there was some design, some um, some approach that they were that they were using, and so we used Quality Matters as the framework for the design. Now the one thing I I'll say about Quality Matters, it is um, only for the design of the course, so it's not really looking at pedagogy or how the course is taught. And um, that's something that, you know, as, as an educator and as a researcher in, in online teaching and learning, I'm also interested in. But Quality Matters came out of um, a consortium of, of institutions of higher ed, and they wanted to make certain that, that this rubric would not be used to evaluate, um, you know, faculty who teach online but just to look at the design. So it is looking at design um, from the student perspective, and I, also, I like it for that reason as well. Um, so it really is, is what we used to guide their design. And then we also looked at, as I mentioned earlier, understanding by design. So when they were looking at their course, um, they, and they were looking at their goals, objectives, assessments, and activities, they were, um, that's, that's sort of where, where we use the understanding by design framework. So asking themselves, what is, is it that, you know, what are the big essentials? You know, what do students have to know um, at the end of this course? So I, I just wanted to make that, um, that point about the Quality Matters rubric. And somebody asked, what's the cost for the, for the rubrics? Um, Actually, the 612 rubric, uh, the general uh, standards and, the, spe and the, um, the specific standards are available online at no cost. Now, to get the, the narrative, then you have to belong to, um, to uh, Quality Matters, and usually that's through a consortium. Um, our district is a member through a, a local consortium, a, um, an educational agency. And I know uh, when I was at Ohio State, we also were part of a higher ed consortium. And so that helps um, cut down on the costs. So um, with access to, to the rubric, you can, you can use it as a framework for design, which is what we did. And you can also use it to conduct informal reviews. And, that, and that's sort of how we did our peer reviews. So there really isn't a cost to get access to the, to the rubric. But if you want to use it in a formal sense, like some universities want their courses to be certified by Quality Matters, in which case you would have to pay for a certification. And it's quite, um, um, quite a process. In other words, they want it formally reviewed, and it involves a variety of people. Um, and I've, with the higher ed rubric, it's been a while since I've looked at it. I don't know if you get all of the specific standards um, at their uh, at their site. I can't I can't remember. I know that the general the nine general standards are available. Okay. So going to the next slide, um, this gives you um, an idea of what our graduate course looked like. So I mentioned earlier I wanted the course to be a model for them. Not only, you know, was it content um, that, that I was interested in, I also wanted to model a course that uh, was designed that um, met the Quality Matters um, general standards. So you can see on their landing page, and I don't know if you're familiar with Schoology, you have two options for a landing page. You can have an updates page, which looks a lot like um, a Facebook page with announcements and updates, or you can have a materials page as your landing page. I opted for the materials page 
of the landing page. So as soon as the, the faculty logged into our Introduction to Designing Online Courses, this is the page on which they landed. So you see that there's a Start Here um, folder, and it's in that folder that I provided them with a syllabus and um, information about navigating Schoology, um, also any communication guidelines, you know, just it's the type of, of information that you would expect to get the first on your first day of a graduate course. It's all that housekeeping and administrative stuff that faculty, um, you know, give to you on that on that first day. That syllabus is so overwhelming, and you think there's no way I can do all of this. And then I chose to um, design the course based on weekly modules. Um, it just worked out well for me. Now. Some of our faculty have designed their courses based on units or topics, however, however you want to do it. What's important is that you are consistent from a design perspective because you want it to be consistent for your students. So you see there that um, you see the first five or six weeks there and then um, with, the, um, with the title of the week, like week one, Introduction to Online Teaching and Learning, then I have a subtitle. Like this week, um, we look at best practices and scholarship. So they know that there are going to be some readings about, you know, some, some maybe best and emerging practices as well as, as research in um, online teaching and learning. So I'm, I try to be pretty consistent with the layout. Now what you don't see, and I'm sorry I didn't include this, um, when they open, when you would open one of these um, folders, each folder has an overview page. So I call it an advanced organizer. So as soon as you enter the week, you have the big picture. You have the, the goal for the week. Um, you have the objectives for the week. And you know what your um, activities and or assignments are for the week. So I like that, that advanced organizer. Um, and almost every week they had um, some type of reading and some discussion. Um, they also maintained um, a reflection journal during this first course as well as the second, the supervised practicum. And then sometimes the activities were just really practical, like, um, you know, working on um, redesigning an, an activity, you know, maybe they had, um, you know, a 40-minute lecture and we talked about how those things typically don't translate well into an online environment. So we, um, we talk about chunking that material or coming up with an alternative way of getting that information to the, to the student, you know, so um, very hands-on, very practical um, kinds of activities. Um, okay. So, I'll, and I can answer more specific questions about the course if anybody's interested, um, you know, later on. Um, and I think we'll have some time for what I like to call faculty voices. Liz is going to um, put in some links to some videos because it's one thing for me to talk to you about the course and, and how I felt about it. Um, it's another thing for you and me <laughs> to hear the faculty responses. And I can say to you that I paid them nothing um, to, to um, you know, create, to create these videos. So it's, it's both humbling uh, for me to, to hear them um, and uh, just amazing at, at what they accomplished. But anyway, I do want you to know that um, we provided faculty with some incentives. I also um, feel strongly about um, providing faculty with, with what they need and this was definitely um, a journey and a difficult one. And so each faculty member, thanks to the grant, uh, received a MacBook Pro, a 15-inch MacBook Pro, and an iPad because I think that if you are asking faculty 
to do something, you have to provide them with the tools and the resources. And they received a small stipend, they received a thousand dollars, and they received some, uh, they did receive some release days. We had one day a month that was very focused on the work. Um, again, I think it's, uh, it's a philosophical um, decision and position. Um, I, it, it, you, we know that professional development has to be meaningful and it ha has to be sustained. And I think that one of the reasons that this program was so successful is that we, we did just that. Um, we focused on just a few things throughout the entire year. Um, and then recognition. I, I just, it was important for me to celebrate our successes in December and also in May. And um, I also um, celebrated it through um, uh, newsletter, two newsletter articles. Um, um, uh, what, I forget what we call it at the district level. Um, like, like these news blasts that we do. Um, and also um, a brochure and a, and a web page. Lots of, lots of recognition. And these, some of these faculty also presented at the eTech Conference, State Technology Conference. Um, I'll just briefly show some of the programs that they use to, to redesign work. Um, and sorry, I misspelled. That should be uh, Sophia, not Shopia. So that is Sophia.org. Sorry about that. And Show Me, uh, Show Me is an iPad app, and um, that was very popular with a couple of our um, our faculty who um, like to do little demonstrations. For example, our physics teacher did used Show Me a lot just to reteach something or to demonstrate a difficult to understand concept. And so did our um, we had a social studies teacher and a writing uh, an English teacher. It was amazing the things that they did. Um, we had one teacher experiment with assistment. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that one, but um, not as successful as um, he had hoped. Um, still kind of, you know, working with that one. Many of them use Google Docs and Forms um, to to do interactive writing and to provide feedback. Our, our social studies teacher loved Google Docs for the comments feature and, um, you know, giving students formative feedback. And then, of course, um, we use Schoology. We use Google Forms for a lot of the surveys. I collected data from students um, midway through the course and then also just um, and in the process of completing an end of course survey. And I also collected data from the faculty. Um, on their on their experiences too, and I, I use Google Forms. Love Google Forms for that. So I think Liz, because it's 619, let's um, let's put in the links to the videos, and um, you shouldn't have any trouble with the the videos. They're um, they're YouTube videos, and um, they're public, but they're not. Um, what is it called in YouTube? I forget now. There, um, I can't remember. But anyway, unlisted. Yes, thank you. It's like having an unlisted phone number, right? So they are. You shouldn't have any any trouble by accessing those. And if you want to um, click on those links, feel free to do that right now, and you can listen away. And I'll just keep chatting a bit. Um, so just to give you an idea of our next steps, um, as I said, we, we just finished our course for um, the first cohort. <clears throat> they will um, implement their course starting uh, in the fall, because remember they just had a half year of implementation, so now they'll have, they'll have a full year. So students actually were uh, able to um, enroll in a, a blended course. So in their program of studies, they saw, let's see, CP English 10 and then CP English 10 blended. So we had 145 students participate this year and we have about 165 um, enrolled in blended courses for next year. And we're a high school of about 1,280 students. 
Um, I begin this journey with a new cohort in the fall, uh, second cohort, but my first cohort will also be involved and they will um, be existing um, in a variety of ways and I'll kind of leave that up to them because they will be involved in this grant through 2017, the first cohort. Um, and then, sorry, if you can hear a little bit of noise, I have my two dogs with me. so. One just sneezed, sorry about that, and one is knocking something off the, the table. So these are the links. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to entertain those. Uh, one thing I did, I noticed, I made a note here. Let me see if I can find it. Um, this was before this session started. Um, I just, if I can offer some some advice, um, I would say start early. Um, if you and if you are planning to either develop a new course or you want to transition an existing course, and I would say give yourself three to six months if you have that luxury. And um, for, for a variety of reasons, give yourself time to um, find resources, to play around with resources, to think about multiple modes of representing information for students. I think it, it just, it's a lot to get your head around. Um, and, and just understand that it's a messy process. While I have presented this to you in a fairly linear fashion, there were times when teachers, these, these 10 faculty on, on different occasions, thank God, not at the same time, said, I just don't know if I can do this. It, it, was, um, it was a journey. Um, somebody said to me recently, you know, it was a marathon for me. I, I hit walls throughout the process and I just, and that is so typical. Um, Ornelk says, do you also stress, yes. <laughs> Uh, including an orientation um, module in online or does your school provide adequate orientation for students? I thought you were asking me if I stress about something um, because I do. Uh, yes, I think that an orientation is, is a great idea. We can't assume that students, um, you know, know how to navigate an, an online environment and um, did our school provide an adequate orientation for students? No. <laughs> um, and that's something that we, our, our cohort, this cohort one, has talked a lot about. And um, many of them, as they redesigned this course, um, for, you know, made tweaks during the second semester when they implemented it. That was one of the things that many of them said. So since then, between January and May, a couple of teachers have created um, uh, like scavenger hunts. That was for a, that was a tenth grade, I believe, and a ninth grade um, faculty who teach primarily ninth and tenth grade. And I've been working on a Schoology course that I'm I'm putting in Schoology, and um, actually it's in resources. And we have lots of different um, types of resources, so there might be some videos, there might be some step sheets, there might be tutorials, a variety of things. So teachers um, can, um, I, I shared that uh, in, the, um, in the resources, you know, we've got like a public resource, I guess. And so they are sort of picking and choosing and they have all said that they are going to spend their first day with students or maybe their first week even to do an orientation um, on Schoology. I think it's, I think it's critical. Anyone else? Yeah, one other, sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you, Liz. I just wanted to say that, um, I, I should have included and meant to include a link to my syllabus 
it's a Google Doc, and um, if you're at all interested in looking at the syllabus, I'm happy to share that. So um, I'm going to go to the, the last slide there, and I have my email, chalice.one at naples.us. Um, I would say email me if you would like uh, the link to that. Um, and I also want to thank Kathleen Harkless, um, who helped me a lot throughout this process. She is a paid intern. Um, she's not with us anymore, but um, she is preparing to be a teacher, so she's still in college, and she was wonderful. So she helped me a lot with tutorials and um, sometimes facilitating sessions, and, and she and I actually presented at um, the ETEP conference. So I have to give her a lot of credit um, for everything that, that she did to help me. So again, if you'd like um, any information or my syllabus or you just want to ask questions and pick my brain, please email me at chalice.one at naplus.us. All right, I want to just take a minute and thank Catherine for this amazing presentation. This is extremely helpful, I think, to everybody in the room, including myself. And I think we still have a lot to learn about blended and online. And this definitely gets us started thinking about different aspects of it. So thank you again, Catherine, for presenting today. And it was a lively discussion. And so I think it worked out really well to have kind of a small audience for that. It worked out perfect. So um, I posted the link to the session evaluation in the chat room. So please take a minute and take the evaluation and give Catherine some feedback. And again, just thank you so much, Catherine, and applause there. Very nice. Great presentation, and it was fun to work with Catherine again. It's quite quite a joy. So uh, thank you, and thank you everyone for attending. And there's some more great sessions coming up at seven o'clock.